so yeah, I've been building technology that is mostly tangentially related to this for a long time, but like a big part of my motivation for building that technology is so that there would be the framework that I needed to do something like this. Um, and uh, it's only in the last couple of years that the Bitcoin came along and made it so that you could take what I was um, thinking of as, you know, um, maybe actually just like a really obvious thing to do with cryptography um, and then put the word coin on it. And like, you know, now if I wanted to, I could go pitch VCs real easy or whatever. Um, so, uh, but because, um, well, actually, like I, I see this um, and I, I'm calling the thing that I want to build document coin and I wanted to build it to show you the running copy today, but it turns out to be harder than I thought. Um, mostly to just like take the time away from all the other stuff that I do. So, um, so what, I, what I decided to do since I could is really just like capture the philosophy and the ideas and a little bit of the politics behind the approach that I wanted to take, um, that I want to take with this uh, cryptocurrency. And then uh, hopefully, you know, find some folks who can get riled up about it, who want to, uh, you know, help me not do it wrong. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, what is this objective cryptocurrency? Well, um, that's what this talk is about. I guess um, who here knows what a cryptocurrency is? Um, so just a, a, you know basically, right? What it is is um, using math and cryptography to um, you know make numbers behave like we're used to money behaving. So I've got a number, and I'm the only one who can have it. When I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. Um, and uh, and so there's some great things about that, but then there's some things about that that aren't so exciting um, that hopefully uh, we can work around by uh, throwing out certain aspects of, of the way that Bitcoin and, and a lot of the other cryptocurrencies work um, and do something that's a little bit, um, in, in my mind, like more conducive to freedom, um, just in general. Uh, and so that's why my hashtag for this talk is no blockchain. Um, so, uh, so philosophy, what is, um, what is ideology, right? Uh, so so Slavoj Slavo Zizek um, has this concept of ideology that it's essentially the assumptions you don't know you're making, right? It's, it's the, your culture that you're so steeped in that you don't know it's there. Um, and so that's one of, the, one of the main ideas that I want to explore, but um, there's kind of two other philosophical ideas and then we'll look at the intersection of all of them and, and hopefully get excited about what we can do with cryptocurrency. Um, so legibility is another important philosophical idea. Um, and maybe in, in this example, like the, the slides are all linked up so you can click through to the blog post that I got this picture from. Um, but uh, these are two forests and one of them is more legible to us, right? So you can ask yourself like, where would you rather live as a squirrel? <laughs> right? Um, legibility is going to be different depending on your point of view and, and your culture and, and your values. And so value is sort of the last philosophical idea that I wanted to dig into. Um, and uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different theories of value. Like there's, uh, Marx kind of did a theory of value that then Ricardo like, did a lot more. And when people think of Marx's theory of the labor theory of value, they're not really thinking about what Marx said. Um, they're thinking about what Ricardo said a lot of the time. Um, but David Graeber has this really interesting book that'll be in the footnotes later um, about uh, anthropological theory of value. So like, if you look at non-market societies, how do they value things? Um, and he comes up with, you know, a really, um, I really like this distillation of what does it mean? You know, what is, what is the concept of value about? It's about how do we know when we're doing something, whether or not that's important. Right, so like maybe it's important because like there's an audience, or maybe it's important because you know you've been training for years, or right. Um, there's just, maybe it's important because it's part of this ceremony that we've been doing for generations. Um, there's lots of reasons something could be important, um, and uh, and then um, oh back button laser. Um, so this is a, a potlatch. Uh, it's you know, around these parts, it was how the economy was conducted for a long time. 
So you would work really hard to like gather up a bunch of stuff, whatever the stuff might be, and then you throw a party and give it all away. And that was how people got social status. And it's also, um, it was, it happened frequently enough and with enough you know, volume and stuff that it was actually, you know, had sort of an inf information role in the economy similar to what money has in our economy. Um, and, and it distorted the economy in similar ways. Like there was just like a whole bunch of people building like awesome wooden boxes to carry their stuff home from the potlatch in so they could show off on the way home, right? Um, and uh, um, so if you, from our 2014 perspective, like it's easy to see how there's value there, right? There's a bunch of people getting together, doing something they think is important on a regular basis, like you know, pouring large amounts of their GDP equivalent into this activity. So um, it's gotta be valuable. Uh, and, and I guess it's also, I don't have to explain too much, like the stock market, stock tickers, right? There's a lot of people who think that's really valuable and they'll like spend their whole life dealing with it. Um, so uh, those are just a couple of conceptions of value. And then, um, you know, when you have different values, uh, they don't necessarily mix well. Um, it's sort of like oil and water. Um, so uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, I think, are the names of these philosophers who, who talk about deterritorialization, which is like when you go in, like say as the colonizer, and you say like, no more potlatching, and then re-territorialization where people figure out that they can do something that gets the potlatch job done, kind of, sort of, but you know, using something that you know, falls under the radar of the colonizer or whatever. Um, and, uh, and so those are, those are the philosophical concepts that I kind of want to bring up. And then, um, I feel like legibility is like a really good way or like a, a, an interesting way to understand all kinds of political struggles. Um, so, uh, like one thing that, that's really easy to describe in a way that we'll all decide is valuable is eyes on the street. Right, like, do you want to have like a faceless brick building and then like be hanging out on that sidewalk, or do you want to be outside of a building like this where there's eyes on the street, um, or there's people sitting around, you know, on stoops or whatever? Um, but if you look at like Portland has this really, uh, you know, ugly gentrification, pre-gentrification history of suppressing, right? Um, basically suppressing black prosperity, and uh, and I think that, you know, the you can look at all the reasons and people like come up with these market-based explanations, but um, I think it's really because you've got a culture that's not legible to the other culture, right? And then on top of that, that you know, um, there's uh, right, obviously racism is is a major part of it, um, but even just having having a, you know to see prosperity. Oh, this is um, Williams, where there's kind of nothing. Yeah, this is, this is right where the Emanuel Hospital, where everything got bulldozed so they could not expand the hospital. Um, so, so anyway, that's just, I, for me, it's, a, it's an example of how you can use these philosophical tools to look at something. Um, is, is, oh, these cultures, like, maybe they could mix, but what's happening here is there's actually a bunch of value being created that, the, you know, that your capitalist value system can't exploit, and so it has to destroy it. Um, so... Um, so that's enough politics. Let's get back to philosophy. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, right, there's been a lot of discussion. Maybe even you know, maybe the discussion has even started to wind down. But about um, you know, the one percent or the ninety-nine percent or whatever, um, and uh, you know, it's real easy to get people fired up by looking at how you would measure the difference between the richest guy and the second richest guy, and like, oh, the that just that difference alone is like would keep this whole, everyone who died that year from dying, right? And so like, um, like why do we need, uh, and, so, and so the way I, I'll, I'll, I'll telegraph a little bit, what I, what I, where I come from that is like, why do we need to measure that so carefully? Can't we just be more slackers about measuring? Um, but, the, uh, um, but the progressive dream is to flatten the curve, right? They're not gonna, um, question the, ne the necessity of having, um, you know, numbers employed in such a manner, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, and I think that's because there's an unspoken assumption, and this is where ideology comes in, right? There's an unspoken assumption that without using numbers to, like, manage an economy, we would just fall into chaos, right? And we'd be at each other's throats and it would be horrible. Um, and so if you buy into that, then, um, you know, the solution to this is this. Um, 
but uh, I guess right what, what we're looking at mathematically there is depending on how you look at it like either a total ordering where everybody has you know, a certain amount of money or like maybe because there's enough slippage going on there's a partial ordering but there's still an ordering um, so like this is the kids in math class getting drilled into them the idea that like you should be able to count like it's real important to know how many things there are um, and then this is mathematically sort of like the loosest concept there is that would still capture right that um, uh, curve that we saw earlier. Um, but uh, uh, from, from an ideology standpoint, like just the fact that we employ the number line in such a basis, right? Like that's, that's the, uh, um, the, fish, the fish tank that we don't know we're swimming in. You see all these like, let's have a win-win solution to you know, fill in the blank and it involves funding X, Y, Z. Um, so, uh, but we have to remember, I mean, I don't know if, if, if all I get out of having thought through this is remembering that that's a, like a polite fiction basically or a consensual hallucination or something. Um, because there's totally people who get along fine without numbers. Um, and it's not that they're not smart enough to count. You take them and you teach them counting and they're like, oh, that's a neat trick. Um, but uh, they're uh, able to organize, and, it's, and they're not primitive in the sense of having unsubtle understanding of the world, right? They've got, they take what, the energy that we might pour into ranking everybody, you know, um, exactly along a number line, and pour it into knowing who everybody is, and, you know, having, uh, and, and having a different sort of lifestyle in general, right? Um, and so I guess the question is, like, can we do something like this, um, or you know, uh, can we scale the gift economy? Can we come up with something that is, uh, you know, uses these? I, I'm I'm not totally against numbers. I'm just against the concept of putting them in a number line, right? So we can use cryptography to build instruments that have some of the benefits of uh, money, but also the benefits of um, of being subjective, right? Of of like capturing what what was you know maybe neat about this way of living or the way that you know so, some people still manage to to live um so just to like remind everybody it's kind of this gift economy is an anthropological curiosity today but in 1850s 1860s it was threatening enough that it was banned you know the canadian government said if you do this you're breaking the law um and when you go look at their justifications for that, they say, oh, these natives just don't work hard enough, and they're doing this crazy party that keeps them from working. So it's a legibility justification, but like, there's, really, there's, there's some real politic at the bottom of it of like, you know, if they can organize their society without even using our tools, then they don't need us. And so um, we have to you know, do something about that, right? Um, so, so a subjective cryptocurrency would mean that everybody sees a different partial ordering. Um, it would mean that, like, you know, I have great wealth in, um, you know, database storage engines, and that doesn't impress you, right? So, um, you know, there'd be other people that you would see as being farther up the number line, as it were, than me. Um, but then like somebody else might be really impressed that I used to work with like a disco band that they like. And so, you know, for them that would be, that would put me, you know, above, above, you know, right. It would, it would swap the ordering of things. So depending on who you are, when you are, right. Um, with the perspective you have, you would rank everybody differently in terms of, you know, how much value they control, how much wealth they have, I guess. Um, if we didn't have, you know, this concept that we're going to put a number on wealth and, and just be done with it. Um, and so that's why I say no blockchain, because uh, at least in my mind, Bitcoin is like, you see all these people who are like super duper, Bitcoin is the revolution, right? They're, they're like, I uh, think that it's, it's lovely, but to me, it's not any, uh, it doesn't give you any more freedom than the US dollar, right? Maybe less. Um, it, it, because there's, not a place for noise to build up, right? With cash, you can like stick it somewhere. No one knows you have it. Um, with Bitcoin, it's still in the blockchain. It's a global variable, and we have to, you know, fight over the global variable all the time. Um, 
so uh, I don't think of Bitcoin as it's if, if, if money sort of right like ratchets up the pressure on humans being humans right Bitcoin just does it more um, and uh, and so maybe we can do do something um, else right um, and Oh, I forgot to put the screenshot of the, there was a tweet somebody had about like, if you're, if your awesome, disruptive, new economy startup has any dollar value, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, can we build something that like doesn't have an exchange rate? They can't function um, in the ways that we think of dollars functioning, but can still provide the information role in the economy to like, you know, keep us from collapsing into, um, you know, a state of nature or something, um, maybe. Uh, so I've been thinking about that problem for a while and like maybe it's like just the association game, but to me, the, you know, uh, PGP, GPG style web of trust data structures, like kind of smell like what I would want this coin to look like um, because they are subjective, right? Like Sally could trust Joe um, and, and Sally could trust Tony, but, but not John or whatever, right? Everyone's gonna have a different position in the graph and see a different world because of that position they're in. Um, but like, it's, it's really hard. Here's, here's a basic primer on public key cryptography. Um, and, uh, and this is just one, actually two of the use cases that, that Morgan had in, in her talk, but like basically there's this crazy math that lets you make a key pair and you've got a number you can shout to the world and you've got a secret number. And um, if somebody has your public key, then they can encrypt a message and as long as you're the only one with the private key, you can read it and nobody else can. Um, and then there's kind of a converse where you can sign messages and anyone who knows a key is your public key knows that you signed it because you had to have the private key to do the signing. Um, but like, where it all gets interesting is how do we know if it's really Alice's key? Um, and usually this is where it breaks down and sucks in like one of two ways. Um, <laughs> one of the ways is you just end up like kicking the can down the road and say, I, I don't know, we'll just ask them if it's really Alice's key. Um, and that's how the web works today. Um, you just, your browser comes hard coded with a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, key pairs, key signatures that it trusts, and those include ones that you probably don't trust. And so uh, they've mitigated some of the worst attacks in most recent browsers, but until recently, you know, anyone from the government of Qatar could put up a website that said it was Google, and if they had man in the middle of you, you'd be just like, you know, you wouldn't know. Um, now they've done certificate pinning, which says like, if this says it's Google, but you, Google used to always have this signature, now it's got a new signature, at least to warn me, um, which helps somewhat with that. If you've talked to somebody once, you can talk to them again. Uh, but still, it's uh, fundamentally, it just cent centralizing stuff in a certificate authority doesn't really solve the problem. It just shovels the complexity around. Um, and so there is like a, a good solution um, which is a key signing party. Has anyone ever like been to a key signing party? And yeah, a <laughs> couple of. <laughs> so, so apparently if you just all, you know, make your, your GPG key and then print out, you know, a list of everybody's public, you know, signature of their public key and then go down the list of the party and say, is your signature F, A, D, E, right? <laughs> And then people say yes, and then you get to the bottom of the list, and then everyone can go and, and look at everybody else's um, you know, passport and driver's license, and then put a checkbox on the piece of paper, and when you're done, um, you know, if everybody's checkboxes all line up, then you'll believe the key ring that the, the signing party organizer you know, maybe sends out or whatever. Um, and so that's obviously the wave of the future. My new startup is key signing parties everywhere. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think the math is right. Um, I think the, the structure is right because the centralized approach is really, and in general, like I think this, any centralized algorithm is hopefully something you can think of as a special case of a distributed algorithm. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, VeriSign showed up with a key signing party, then maybe they can play too, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so 
it's still not it's still not a cryptocurrency yet, so we got to put a coin on it. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, I, I guess um, I've got now. This is the part where if I'd had an extra three months between in the last three months somehow, uh, I would be showing real software. But instead, I'll show you my as far as I got with the mockups and, and the schema. Um, I think there's you know there's sort of like maybe like different levels of abstraction you can describe something in. And so um, using similar math to uh, PGP Web of Trust is like a very abstract level. And then this is semi-abstract semi where, where I'm saying like, oh, what's a coin? A coin has just like some data that anyone can see that advertises itself. It's in the coin directory. You can go look up that coin and you know, see who's held it before. I don't know. Um, and then it's got the part that only the person who is holding the coin now can see. Um, and, and because I'm trying to prioritize usability over security, also anyone who ever held the coin before may still have a copy of it, right? Um, then uh, signatures are just cryptographic signatures. Um, and I think signatures and history start to go together because what a transaction looks like is I just sign a new version of the coin um, where I was the most recent bearer and you're the new bearer. Um, and so, you know, then you just have this chain all the way back to whoever minted the coin in the first place. Um, so, kind of, I think maybe the simplest thing, and so, so then as we get like less abstract, I was thinking like, how can I make it so this is something people get and don't have to be crypto heads to care about? And so instead of um, public and, and bearer sides of some abstract data, although the container would support that, you just, um, have both of these be derived from a photograph that was taken at the time the coin was minted. And the bearer side is the photograph itself. And the public side is the photograph with an Instagram filter on it that makes you look like Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea, and maybe I think I'm looking at my next slide, which is like what happens when you're in the app and you've got some coins, but I'll talk through creating a coin first. Um, so if you were to create a coin, like uh, in, in the anthropological theory of value that I talked about earlier, um, he talks about different kinds of, different kinds of non-market economies. And um, in the, in the um, Polynesian islands and in, in Melanesia, they do the, this um, kind of circulating gift exchange, which doesn't look like it's, uh, there's gonna be reciprocity until you look at it for like long and long enough. And then you can start to see that it, it balances out in ways that people are aware of. Um, but one of the things that gets circulated is an heirloom, right? And it, heirloom is the right word for it, right? It's, a, it's an object whose value is a lot of it is based in the stories and the history attached to the object. Um, and then like it has in common with this um, bearer side that like the most valuable heirlooms are gonna be hidden away like in the back of a cave nobody knows about and you only bring them out once a year to show them off kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, so how would you create a coin in this app? You would uh, take that photo. It would maybe like be open, open invite if anybody else wants to sign your coin. So you can have like a two person coin or a three person coin might be worth more than a one person coin. Might be, depending on who the people are and who is valuing it. Um, and, then, uh, and then after all those signatures come in, the person who uh, you know, initiated the, um, the minting process closes the coin by signing it themselves and encrypting this bit. And then they can give it to somebody um, by you know, signing it off to somebody and re-encrypting the bearer side with the, um, you know, the recipient's public key. So only the bearer can now read the content. Um, so then I started to think through like, how is this app gonna be, you know, like competitive with Dogecoin? Um, and so, uh, so the idea, I just kind of like, you know, started to think it should be really tactile. So you've got coins on the screen because all the coins are different value. Like I can, if I think this coin is like, oh wait, this coin is like really cool. I might pull it down here, right? And have like my most important coins close to me. Um, and then have other coins that like, I wouldn't mind giving away as much up here. Um, if I'm about to say make a transaction, I want to um, buy an espresso. Um, maybe I would flick some coins up to the top, off, off the top of the screen, and now you know scroll up and look at the offer drawer. And um, you know maybe I think like an espresso is worth that time that I um, 
you know, got this rock star to shake my hand, right? Um, or whatever. And, or maybe it's worth like these three really cool, uh, um, you know, times that I won in a video game, right? Um, or maybe it's worth, um, you know, a couple other times that, you know, maybe my buddy did something. I ended up with a coin from my buddy that's kind of cool, and then another coin. I don't even know where it came from, but I ended up with it. And so um, I tell the barista, hey, like, which one do you want? And they say, well, I'll take these, or whatever, right? So it's really, it has to be subjective on both sides of, of the deal. So they're, they're picking, um, you know, you give them more than one offer, or they pick the one that's right for them, because how could you know what the right offer is for them? Um, and so a uh, screen about, oh, who am I going to give it to? Yeah, there we go. Um, oh, you just gave two coins to Extracto. Um, are you sure you want to do that? Yay, thank you. I hit a unicorn in the wave. There's secretly a unicorn in there. I don't know. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that's most of it. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, like, you could make people name their coins, but maybe that's not great. Um, and uh, um, you know, you've got to have you got to have the ability to wait for people to to mint the coin with you. Maybe like when you do that, you would have you would split the picture, so you have you know like eight pictures, like pieces of eight or whatever, you know, for depending on how many people signed it with you. Um, and so, I don't know, maybe this should be like half Extracto and half me if I made a coin with the coffee shop because they wanted to commemorate some occasion. Um, and uh, I think, I'm gonna, see, I'm gonna see what, oh yeah, and then there's just like a whole bunch more to the app where you could, uh, and, and this is where like security and, and, and privacy like, and um, you know, sort of, like maybe we could add the ability to send a direct message to somebody that is in the coin network somehow. And so that would be encrypted and private to them. And how you would know that it's really Alice's key is because of all the other transactions that, that you'd really be sending the message to somebody's wallet. But you would, you know, you'd be able to, to look and see like, oh, I've, I'm aware of like 10 transactions from this wallet that only Alice would have made. Um, and so that's, it's a little bit hard to put it into a you know modern American transactional context where you're not always friends with the barista. Um, but if you look at uh, the way gift economies operate, that it, it's um, it's a lot more like a social network than it is like a bank. Um, so uh, I think that's it for the like main content. Uh, I, hopefully, we can have a big discussion. Um, I've got uh, a reading list of some of the philosophy that I've been looking into over the last year. Um, this David Graeber is really good for understanding like the long-term history of money, and like the more you understand about it, the more it becomes clear that it really is like some sort of consensual hallucination, right? It's not um, uh, real in the in the sense that Zizek calls real. <laughs> um, and so uh, that the first 5,000 years is um, something everyone should read. And then toward an anthropological theory of value, like I really liked, but it also took me like three months to read it because uh, it was kind of a hard one. Um, Berardi, uh, Bifo Berardi has a bunch of books. Um, he was like an um, autonomist, uh, sort of anarcho-communist, Italian, May, May 68 kind of crowd um, who is now uh, after the future and has another book about post-futurism, but like it's really about how the new value system, like th th there was this futurist manifesto that was written in 1912 or something about how everything needs to be like faster and more war and explode all the things. And um, his is like, we should hang out in the park and maybe look at a flower. <laughs> um, and that's for you know 2012. Um, so, I mean, his, his real, and, and, he, and I think, it's theoretically deep, it's not just fun, but his real uh, argument is that the only solution to the crisis of overproduction, right, is like if we, do, if we want to avoid World War IV, like we just all have to relax. Um, so uh, that, that's what, may, you know, those are the things that made me, oh, and, and this is just credits um, from, the, from the pictures and stuff. So I don't know, um, does anyone have any questions? We've got about 10 minutes.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it has to be, I mean, it's like, so one, one way you can think about it is any one of these coins can have an exchange rate, right? You could put it on eBay. Um, and so different coins, like maybe the, maybe the high bidder for all coins is going to be like way outside of the bounds of the person you're going to run into on the street. Um, so maybe, and maybe there's some, some arbitrage there. Maybe you're willing to take a coin that you don't really want that much because you think someone else might want it. Um, but uh, I think also like anytime you're making a deal, every, everyone, I mean, if you're a coffee shop, like you want people leaving with coffee, right? And so um, if uh, the things that they're giving you to leave with coffee are useful for you in another context, then you're not gonna be super picky. It's more like an expression of personality or something, what you choose. Right? No, that's a super hard problem because, like, the thing that is totally left out of my assumption set, right, is like, what if you're too broke for a smartphone? Um, because if you, if if what I'm if what I'm saying is like, oh, these um, non-exchange forms of, you know, or, or these other forms of value are uh, maybe like legible to people who you know have like a different outlook than you know someone educated in the Western system. Um, then it doesn't necessarily solve a whole lot of problems to build an app they can't use. Um, except for maybe it's just like, it's, well, I like to say Bitcoin is like the toy version of what we're going to be using in 100 years. Um, I hope this is the art project version. Like, so not everyone has to be, art doesn't have to be accessible to everybody for it to do its job. Yeah. How do we start the process going? So like maybe a time when a coin might get minted is uh, my mom needs a ride to the airport and you offer to do the favor and we take a picture like, you know, of you leaving for the airport, the airport. with my mom in the car and, that, and then I give that coin to you. Uh -huh. But anyone can make a coin whenever they want. You could hook up coin to your um, video game console and make it every time you press the shoot button. And those coins might not be worth anything to another person. So um, if you... I think probably to make a coin that would exchange well, all you need is like a smartphone and a little bit of cleverness, right? So this is definitely clever, but money's going to Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe I missed this. How do you prevent somebody from finding two different transactions your coin? Oh, if you do that, then they get shunned. It's really bad form to, to, to double spend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, and, and so part of the idea, this is why I, I talked about translucent, like when I start to think more deeply about what happens when people have lots of coins, um, is like, let's say I need to get approved for a loan. You can almost imagine, like, it's, it's, it's not even imaginary that uh, a loan officer might want to look at your Facebook account, right, today. Um, and so you can imagine, like, going to get approved for a loan, um, you might want to have, like, a... Um, cryptographic way to say like I've got coins from you know such an you know, I've got I've got a coin from Tim O'Reilly right um, but I don't want to actually share the coin um, you know not even not even the public part of the coin um, so you could do lots of like partial disclosure type stuff yeah something I mean I figure like math people can figure it out <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, and that definitely, I mean, that's definitely the case. That's like the dynamic that is missing from money, um, right? So like I might in this, if this system had hegemony, I might go to coffee shops that had suppliers that shared my value system just because I know my money is worth more there.
That's definitely, I mean, I can totally see you, you know, you go and do like, um, you garden at the, the elementary school and uh, the, the teacher running the garden like mints a coin and gives it to you and then you can use that coin. Um, or you might mint an extremely valuable coin, like you might mint a coin on the occasion of your child's birth and then not ever spend it. Um, but you also, like the first thing some of my buddies came up with is like, people would just use this for blackmail. And I was like, oh, I guess. Well, this is a super important problem to solve, right? Because um, if we go back to the, to the, the um, wealth inequality curves that we looked at and think about like, what's the opposite concern from measuring the difference between the, the richest person and the second richest person, um, it's uh, how do we track the freeloaders, basically. Um, and so the, the solution for the way that Bitcoin does it is they make it like mathematically impossible to double spend or you know break the rules, um, and they anticipate like you're actually you're exposed to. There's supposed to be bad actors in in Bitcoin, um, and something like this. If you had, a, I mean, it's basically a reputation um, system, right? So if you built up a wallet that um, had a bunch of, of value, you know, a bunch of coins in it, had minted a bunch of coins, right? So a wallet's like a proxy for your identity. You might have more than one. You might have your like your church wallet and your and your bar wallet, right? Um, but uh, if you built up this wallet that had a certain amount of background on it, then uh, you'd be throwing it away if you were to like say, um, you know, take take the picture of the eggs you got and pretend it was actually like two pictures of eggs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's not. There's a much bigger question that you had about social media in general. <laughs> I don't really know the answer. <laughs> um, uh, did you have a question, or is that? Oh, I, it was related to the time, I, the, the time notion, and I was trying to figure out how it would get more generic, how it would make it more generic, but then maybe that takes away the artfulness of your system and uh, maybe some of the beauty of it. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, that, there's, the abstraction layers can get, you know, like, like let's say it worked and got, like the point of it is to package up these, um, these verbs in a way that can be consumed by non-technical people. Um, but then once you have that flowing, right, then you can start to ratchet up either the security, right, you can have like a, a, a gesture where you directly sign each other's public keys by like holding your phones together or something. Um, and, or, you know, doing other things to um, do something more than just the, the mesh that gets built up as a byproduct of the transactional activity. Um, and you could also, tunnel data other than photos over the coin mechanism. Uh, question? What uh, mushrooms should I eat? Because you have to think about the topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this reading list is totally <laughs> where I would start. Um, I'm in the middle of another book by Galloway. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I totally was meant to say this in answer to your question, I think. 
I think the whole thing is like the moral equivalent of like, let's say we could, w with, with the particular of, of running photos through the system instead of, you know, you could put, um, you could put contracts, right, uh, on there uh, and just have contracts be signed. Um, but uh, if you're doing photos, it's the moral equivalent of taking a Polaroid on a special occasion, have everyone who was there sign it, and then signing it over to somebody, and then just continuing to sign the back of the Polaroid over to new people, right, like a check or something. Um, it's basically just that in digital form. Oh yeah, that's a really, that's a really good, um, I mean, because, because I'm imagining the data structure for all this being um, super lowest common denominator, like just JSON and there's like IETF specs for how to do the signature formatting and stuff. Um, you have all different systems that can consume these coins. Uh, and then some systems might, their whole purpose might just be to, uh, you know, estimate the value of a coin. Um, and so, you can imagine like there's that same data um, getting value, you know, are, are, you the, are you the customer or are you the product problem of like, well maybe there's a service that just really, really wants me to upload the public signatures of all the coins I hold. Um, because if people start doing that, they can, you know, extract network value out of that. And maybe it's worth it to me to have done that because I can learn people who have interest in the coins that, that I have and then go do business with them. Uh, Yeah, totally. Like, yeah, as I mean, as with any of these heirlooms, like if you look at the anthropology, as they, you know, get worn by the warrior who won the battle or something, then uh, they gain value. Except for they also like, they're just arbitrarily destroyed. Like, oh, it's not worth anything anymore. Like everyone can just decide that um, if it's a small enough group. Uh, yeah. Um, wait, I'm not, I'm, is the you the person who doesn't have the smartphone or? I, I personally can afford a smartphone and choose not to have a smartphone. Yeah. So, and, and somebody had asked earlier and you were like, well, maybe you should keep people can't access it. Because it's a poor issue. But what if it's not a poor, like what if it's not a monetary, I can afford something to access this app issue. Yeah. Yeah, well, I bet it would be some sort of weird Venn diagram of Instagram users and Bitcoin enthusiasts at first. <laughs> um, but the only, the only requirement is, I mean, the only goal is to have it be like, even if it was uh, one hundredth as popular as an Instagram, it would still make a huge dent in the cryptographic world. And it might get rid of some of the reasons to dislike and to, to stay away from social media and smartphones, right? If, if this was your channel and there was compatible clients from all sorts of different vendors and you, know, you felt like you knew exactly what was going into the cloud and what wasn't, then maybe more people would be comfortable with it. Yes, yeah, and that's totally like a psychology question. I mean, maybe all this does is like become briefly faddish and expose people to the idea of, um, you know, sort of non-commodity uh, exchange. Uh, I don't know. Right, and it's not doing any good, yeah. A real Polaroid would work because they fade over time. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of like economic research about demurrage currencies that do that. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's why I, I wanted to come here so I could hear, get ideas like that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so where I'm at in this is like, I know I could write the code. It would just take me an infinite amount of time. <laughs> so if anybody wants, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if anybody wants to like start an open source project around this sort of thing, um, I've, you know, I've done some of the background reading. I didn't talk too much about the protocols, but there's this thing called, um, the IETF Jose spec. It's JSON object signing and encryption. And all it does is make the decisions that I'm not qualified to make. <laughs> like, what are the right algorithms and how do you compose them and stuff? Uh, yeah, uh, JSON Web Signature, um, I think, is one of them. JWS, I don't know. It's all under the, the Jose um, IETF umbrella. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess trying the whole idea was is to package up this um, web of trust model in like a, you know, kid friendly way and then have uh, maybe it, maybe it becomes cool. Like you, you can imagine if the early adopters were the intersection of Instagram and Bitcoin, like those might be someone that your coffee shop wants to attract. And so maybe the the marginal cost of giving away some free, you know, if, if the only thing you can buy with them is just the one espresso, that's why maybe the number one competition is Dogecoin. No, I haven't looked at it yet. I've heard of it. Uh-huh. We're actually still monetary. We're at time. So we should thank Chris for his. Thank you guys. Time.